Hello everyone, welcome to my tutorial on AWS networking and content delivery services. Before I start my tutorial, I'm a blogger and I write my blog at techieandtravel.com. Do check it out. Also, do check out my YouTube channel and if you like my contents, do like, share, subscribe and comment on it. I have a fundamental concept tutorial on Amazon Web Services and VPC on my channel. Do check that out as well. So let's start with this tutorial. In this tutorial, we'll start with the concept of VPC. Then we'll talk about Direct Connect and SSL VPNs. We'll talk about the DNS service called Route 53. Then we'll talk about peering multiple VPCs and transit gateway. Then we'll talk about NAT instance and NAT gateway and with the load balancing and auto scaling services. Then we'll further discuss about the content delivery services called Amazon CloudFront. And finally, we'll wrap it up with Amazon API Gateway. So let's get started. Virtual private cloud is the area that is private to you in the AWS cloud. That means it is an isolated section where you can launch and create your private infrastructure like EC2 instances, like databases, etc. It's a virtual network. Within VPC, it supports both IPv4 and IPv6. Here, you can customize the networking and you can configure your own IP address range, you can configure your own subnets, and it supports both private and public subnets. That is, if you want to have an area that is accessible from the internet, you can do that with the public subnet. And if you have some components like database that you don't want to expose to the internet and have it in your own private area, you can do so by creating the database in your private subnet. In addition to that, it provides multiple layer of security. You can secure your instances with security group, with network access control lists, etc. So let's understand in brief with the pictorial representation. First, you have to select a region where you want to build your infrastructure. So this pink area represents a region. Next, you select your virtual network area called VPC. So let's say you have a supernet assigned to your VPC as 10.0.0.0 slash 16. So every instances in this VPC will now have the IP range that is supported by the CIDR notation. Then you can further divide this area or VPC into private and public subnets. Then you can create your own instances or resources in these areas. So each of these resources can be secured with security group. Security group are a firewall to these instances. So you can define which ports you want to allow in for SSS, for example, or you can say which IP range you want to allow to access instances from. You can do that with security group. Then you can add an extra layer of security with network access control lists. While security group was the firewall for your EC2 instances, network access control list is the firewall for your VPC subnets. So network ACLs are applied at the subnet level. So any instances within the subnet which are associated with the access control list will follow the rules of network access control lists. That's not the case with security groups because security groups has to be assigned explicitly to the instance. And furthermore, security groups are stateful. This means that any changes applied to an incoming rule will be automatically applied to the outgoing rule. For example, if you allow an incoming port 80 in the security group, the outgoing port 80 will be automatically opened. But network access control lists are stateless. That means, any changes applied to an incoming rule will not be applied to the outgoing rule. That is, if you allow an incoming port 80, you would also need to apply the rule for outgoing traffic on port 80. So now, by default, when you create your VPC, each VPC will have a local router. And this router facilitates the default route for communication within the VPC. Each router has a route table associated with it called main route table. This route table contains the set of rules called routes that are used to determine where the network traffic from your subnet or your gateway is directed. And each subnet in your VPC must also be associated with a route table. The main route table automatically comes with the VPC and it controls the routing for all the subnets that are not explicitly associated with any other route table. 
A subnet can only be associated with one route table at a time. But you can associate like multiple subnets with the same subnet route table. Then you have a virtual private gateway for each VPC, which as the name suggests, is the gateway to your VPC. So you can leverage this gateway to connect your VPC to let's say to your data center with the SSL VPN, which we'll talk about in a bit. Then you have your internet gateway. So internet gateway is a logical connection between your VPC and the internet. And internet gateway allows resources within your VPC to access the internet and vice versa. In order for this to happen, there needs to be a routing table entry allowing a subnet to access to the IGW or internet gateway. That is, an internet gateway allows resources within your public subnet to access to the internet and the internet to the said resources. A subnet is deemed to be public subnet if it has a route table that directs the traffic to the internet gateway. So as I said earlier, by default, the route table that is created when you create a VPC will have an entry in the route table that allows communication for each instances within the VPC to each other. But you need to explicitly define the route for the traffic to the internet via internet gateway in the route table. So if you look at the communication, the traffic from internet passes through the internet gateway, which hits the route table and through the network ACLs, it reaches out to the resources within the subnets. Then you can have NAT gateway or NAT instances. So this is used specifically to allow the resources in private subnet to access to the internet. As I said earlier, the instances within the public subnet will reach out through internet gateway but your private subnet will have the resources like database that you don't want to expose to the internet. But let's say you want your database to reach out to the internet for patching. In that case, you can use the NAT instance or NAT gateway, which is defined in the public subnet and allow communication for your instances in the private subnet through the NAT gateway. Then there is another concept called VPC endpoint. Endpoints enable you to privately access specific AWS services from your own virtual private cloud without public IP address and without requiring traffic or data to travel across the internet. So if you don't have any VPC endpoints configured, then VPC nodes without a public IP, they have to traverse either through a NAT gateway instance or through a NAT service. But with VPC endpoint, your private hosts do not need to traverse through either of those, but they can reach to the S3, let's say, by using the VPC endpoint and it's potentially cheaper and faster. Now that we know most of the components that are required for communication within the VPC uh, or via internet gateway to the internet, uh, what if you want your VPC hosted in AWS to connect to the physical data center? It can be your physical data center or your client's data center. So you can connect your VPC in Amazon Cloud to your corporate data center by establishing an IPsec VPN tunnel. This VPN tunnel provides an encrypted link where your data can pass from the customer network to or from the AWS. And on the AWS side, you attach a virtual gateway to the VPC from which you can create a site-to-site -site VPN. And virtual gateway is the VPN concentrator on the AWS side of VPN connection. And on the data center side, you will have a customer gateway or CZW which is a gateway device in your on-premise network. Now we established a communication between VPC and on-premise network. So let's summarize this. So let's say you have a VPC subnet with IGW or internet gateway and VZW or the virtual gateway configured. Using internet gateway, you can talk to the internet or other AWS services like S3, DynamoDB, but this traffic leaves the AWS network. But if you want your traffic to stay within AWS, you can use the VPC endpoints to communicate with other AWS services, as we talked earlier. Then to connect the on-premise data center, you can establish a IPsec VPN between your VPC and data center. For that, you use virtual gateway or transit gateway on the AWS side. We'll discuss about transit gateway in a bit. And then customer gateway on the data center or the customer side. Now let's say you want a dedicated connection from your data center to the AWS. Let's say you have a business application that stores application data within your data center, but the actual application itself is running in AWS. 
it will be ideal to have a high speed connection between your AWS and data center directly as opposed to having it to send through the internet. AWS Direct Connect does it for you. So with AWS Direct Connect, it enables customers to have a low latency and secure and private connections to the AWS, which requires higher speed or lower latency than the internet. So you might be wondering, what's the difference between Direct Connect and SSL VPN then? Keep in mind that the VPN connectivity utilizes the public internet, and this can have some unpredictable performance despite being encrypted and can present some security concerns as well. Whereas AWS Direct Connect bypasses the public internet and establishes a secure dedicated connection from your infrastructure to the AWS. Now that you connected your VPC to your on-premise network, let's say you have another VPC and you want two VPCs to talk to each other. You can establish a VPC peering between these VPCs, but AWS VPC peering is a point-to-point -point network connection between two VPCs. What if you have more than two VPC? You need to establish a one-to-one -one connection between them. In this picture, you can see a mess of VPC peering. But even after establishing such a mess of VPC peering, VPC A cannot talk to VPC C because it does not have a dedicated one-to-one -one peering between each other. So that's why it's non-transitive. AWS has a solution for this called Transit Gateway. So rather than establishing a one-to-one -one VPC pairing between each VPCs, you can create a Transit Gateway and attach all your VPCs with the Transit Gateway. And in doing so, each of the VPCs that are connected to the Transit Gateway can talk to each other, unlike with VPC pairing. And furthermore, you can utilize this transit gateway to establish SSL VPN connection with your on-premises data center. So instead of virtual gateway, VGW, you can connect to the transit gateway. Next, let's look at the Amazon DNS service called Route 53. Before we talk about DNS, Route 53 is one of the Amazon service that leverages the edge locations within their global infrastructure. On a high level, DNS is a global service. So DNS is a process by which we can map human readable domain names like youtube.com. So all the computers use IP address or numbers as the unique locators. And DNS is a system that converts the domain names and subdomains into those IP addresses. DNS is a connective tissue between the domain name and IP address. So Route 53 is a highly available and distributed as well as scalable DNS service. In addition, it also enables global resource routing. You can send users to any specific servers based on what country they are from. Or you can say, I want to send them to this specific server that responds the fastest. We'll talk about various routing policies in a separate Route 53 specific video. But understand that you can route via latency, you can route via shortest path, where the user are coming from or based on the health of the servers. You can use it to perform health check and monitoring. Automated Route 53 sends a request to the resources over the internet to test the health of resource. And as discussed earlier, Route 53 can be used for domain registration as well. Next, we'll talk about elastic load balancing. Load balancer is a virtual machine or appliance that balances your web application load that could be HTTP or HTTPS traffic that you are getting in. It balances a load of multiple web servers so that no single web servers get overwhelmed. It distributes the traffic across multiple targets. Let's say if we have two web servers serving as a web server and user comes in with a request, we can choose to route the users to any of these servers based on the server load. It integrates seamlessly with EC2 with ECS, which is a container service and Lambda. And it supports one or more availability zones in a region. So we can have our web server in three different availability zone, let's say, and route traffic to those servers. We have three type of load balancer, classic load balancer, or which is referred as ELB, and application load balancer, and network load balancer. Let's talk about scaling in AWS. AWS Auto Scaling is a Amazon service that lets you configure automatic scaling of AWS resources. So it automatically monitors and adjusts the resource to maintain the application performance. You can configure auto scaling for a specific resource or for the entire application that you host in AWS. You can have these many auto scaling groups. You can have EC2 auto scaling groups. 
you can have amazon ec2 spot fleet requests you can have dynamodb and you can have amazon ecs next we have amazon cloudfront so this is a service that leverages the edge location within the aws infrastructure if you listen carefully route 53 was another service that leveraged the edge location it is a content delivery network which means there are servers around the world where you can send your contents to and you may be wondering why do i need to send contents to multiple servers around the world because it will allow the users to get contents from the location that is near to them let's say for example you have this web server and user a and b are trying to reach the web page served by the web server so there are these many multiple locations globally that you can distribute your content to so now if user a makes the request it can be served from the location near it and when user b makes the request it will be served from the location that is nearer to user b so this will improve the user experience drastically also it not only supports the static contents like images and videos but also supports the dynamic contents also it includes various advanced security features like aws shield for ddos which handles the distributed denial of service attacks and aws web application firewall next we have amazon api gateway amazon api gateway is an amazon web service feature that enables developers to connect the non aws applications to the aws backend resources so api is an application program interface and it allows software programs to communicate and making them more functional that is api acts as the front door for applications to access data business logic or functionality from your backend services it's a fully managed api management service so api gateway is an interface that sits in between the application and microservices and developers use them to create publish maintain monitor and secure the apis so amazon api gateway will take care of all the tasks involved in accepting and processing up to hundreds and thousands of concurrent api calls it's deployable with couple of clicks within the management console and you can create an api that acts as a front door for application to access the data without api gateway you would have to connect all your api resources directly to your user facing applications which would make it more difficult to manage responses and implement updates to your business logic or even secure your api so not only api gateway will simplify the way you build and manage the apis but it will also boost your security since you are not exposing any endpoints and it minimizes the attack vector considerably so it's a fully managed api service and it accepts and processes concurrent api calls it also helps in traffic management authorization and access control and it provides monitoring and metrics on the api calls Furthermore, it also integrates seamlessly with other AWS services like Lambda, EC2, etc. So this is it on the AWS networking and content delivery services. I will have a separate video tutorial describing in depth about each of these services. Keep watching and keep sharing. Thank you.